Good evening and aloha. Uh, what I'm about to go over, I'm going to be kind of brief because they wanted me to do 60 years of history in six minutes. So I provided a timeline um, that's out there. And it's not a complete timeline. It just gives you a sense. And the theme of it is basically the why and the how of how we got here and how we got you know, astronomy as an initiative you know, on Mauna Kea. And I'm going to start by just referencing May 22nd, 1960. And I think that's kind of like where it begins. There's a huge tsunami in Hilo, devastates the town. The town's a, a wasteland. The economy is in shambles. Many people lose their work. Many, play, many people lose their, their work areas. Um, so the, the town's 30,000 back then. Now it's 80 when you bring in Puna. The island was 60,000. And now it's 181, 183, and with a de facto population of over 200,000 when you bring in the visitor count. So it's a very different time. It's, it's a time for desperation to see what else you can do. People are talking about the demise of sugar as early as uh, the 60s. They knew it was kind of shaky on that. And so the whole intent was to look for uh, an economic lake. And there were many that they explored. Astronomy happened to be one. And so the question of what was the town's future. So if you go back and read old newspapers, which I did, uh, that captures the character and the spirit of, of Hilo back then, that they wanted to rebuild and they wanted to look at new economic initiatives. And so economic possibilities, I think, was a way to look at it. And so here comes um, a guy by the name of Mitz Akiyama and a gentleman by the name of Howard Ellis. Howard Ellis works on Mauna Loa. He's with the Solar Observatory. And every day he looks across, he sees Mauna Kea, and it's very clear, and there's no cloud cover. Many, many days there's no cloud cover. So he admits, who's then you know, a business person, think about, hey, maybe this is a place that we can do astronomy, we can do a science city, is what they were thinking about at that point in time. So what Mitz does, he writes to over 100 universities uh, to get people if they're interested in coming to look at the science of astronomy on, on Mauna Kea. And so they do a number of things. They, they do Haleakala, but they arrive in, uh, at uh, Mauna Kea. And through his letters, uh, a gentleman by the name of an astronomer, I should say, very famous astronomer uh, by the name of Gerard Kuiper and Alika Herring. Alika Herring is a person who actually surveys potential sites. So they go to Mauna Kea, and they've been all over the world. And basically, uh, this is a quote that Alika Herring says that Mauna Kea is the best site he's ever experienced. And so this is after you know, a number of tours throughout different continents looking at site visits. So that's kind of like, it's Kuiper, and it's a gentleman by the name of Gerard, uh, pardon me, Alika Herring. Then in 1964, the Board of Supervisors, which is now called the Hawaii County Council, they pass a resolution. I think it's Resolution 361. You can go through it, they go through the whole detail of it. But what they're doing is calling upon the governor, they're calling upon the state, um, the congressional delegation, to do some level of road construction. Because back then, from Humaula, it's a jeep trail. You walk, and it's hard to maneuver all the way up. You get up to Halepuaku, and it's even more so. Uh, to get up to that mountain. It just is not accessible. So Governor Burns in 1968, to give the economy a kind of economic boost, to give Hilo, because that was the focal point, uh, a boost. Um, basically, he put the first road in. He put the dollars in for site testing. And so people went up and with, with uh, Kiefer, and looked at that and was deemed that it was one of the, the best sites to do astronomy. So that goes back to like 68. And then going forward, and it's on the timeline, from about the 70s through the 80s, you see a lot of different types of observatories come up. And there's a point in time where people begin to get very incensed about the way things are going on the mountain because when construction is going on and they can complete it, a lot of opala is left. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not kept in a Pono way. And so when the people move forward with that, the uh, universities leave this activity and DLNR 
and the courts say, look, if you're going to do anything anymore, you need to have a better arrangement to manage that mountain. So in about the year 2000, what happens is they have the, based on the auditor's recommendation, the auditor does a, an overview of Mauna Kea and says that if you're going to develop a new master plan, that you need to identify areas that are suitable for astronomical development, but more so, you need to control the thrash. You need to, to have continuous community input. You need to call for rules for managing public access. And you need to have a plan for the Mauna Kea Reserve. That's the thinking back there. Now, as we fast forward to the year 2000, you've come thus far. There's a call to even go further. But that being said, you established the Office of Mauna Kea Management. And on the first session, we heard the very able Stephanie Nagata share with us part of what they did um, and have done and where they've gone. Because prior to that, there was nothing uh, as far as management. And then you kind of like move through all of the different things and rather than get detailed on it because it's very, very technical. What I tried to do was put in when the governor signs into law Act 133, 132, which authorizes people to move forward on administrative rules. And DL, DLNR, a conservation district permit is submitted. So all of these steps are taken. And finally, um, when you get up to about 011, people begin to get, again, kind of an unsettlement as to what's going on on Mauna Kea. And so you begin to have contested case hearings. And so we go from there, um, where a hearing officer comes in, I believe it's in 212, and he receives the facts and the findings and the conclusions from practitioners and others who feel that the mountain is being violated. And based on that, you know, months later, and I believe it's November of 2013, the hearing officer submits his final findings, the fact and conclusions of law to VLNR. Now, uh, UH is given a permit to build TMT on the mountain. Now, this is the linear version. There's a lot of things that are going on. There's a lot of things that are still unsettled. But what I wanted to share with you was the, the, the driver was economy. And to some extent, you know, still tonight we talk about economy, we talk about culture, we talk about balance. And what's interesting, it's recent that people begin to talk about coexistence of science and culture, which is a balance that hopefully what we do here, we can explore and maybe even find. So there's a lot of stuff that the judges do um, uh, based on the Keck Outrigger and stuff on Maui that really raises eyebrows with regard to a project here. But the, the note that I wanted to bring was that astronomer Kuiper and Alika Herring were the beginning of what was to follow a series of telescopes on the mountain with their objective for economy and of course the science version to unlock the mysteries of the universe. Um, I don't think uh, people talked about decommissioning back then. Um, in fact, I know they didn't. It's a recent phenomenon. But now you have people talking about the scopes that are obsolete in the mountain. You need to decommission that and you follow the governor's point of view. Uh, that's echoed in, in the paper and in his plan. And the, the, the sense of the theme that hopefully what we talk about tonight will be insightful, the I-N-S-I-G-H-T-F-U-L, rather than I-N-S-I-T-F-U-L, <laughs> so as we move forward. So I guess one of our uh, objectives is how do we, uh, at least from our uh, committee, how do we look at what we do in terms of con con conversations that we hope we can find common ground in terms of science and culture. And of course, today's paper is kind of interesting because UH outlines a Mauna Kea plan. And April 22nd, I think, is a definite date because that's when the, the protests in the mountain began that held up the construction work on TMT for the last two months. And then we get to it today. So that's a quick six minute. There's more detail in the outline. Um, and again, the outline is not complete. I had three weeks to put it together with innumerable volumes and newspapers, but that's what we did. So aloha and enjoy the evening.